Greetings in the name of Jesus and welcome to Riverside Tabernacle. I'm Pastor Simon and it's my honor to share God's word with you tonight. I trust you will find this message inspiring and uplifting. May you be receptive to the voice of the blessed Holy Spirit. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, we ask for your blessings upon this, your word. Holy Spirit, we ask you for enlightenment and understanding. Father, we ask you to help us to understand your word and to live by your word that we might please you. We ask these mercies in Jesus' mighty name tonight. Amen. George Bernard Shaw, the playwright, once said, A happy family is but an earlier heaven. A happy family is but an earlier heaven. He was on to something there, for the family unit is a model from the God of heaven. When God made the universe, he made man as a male and female with a command to start a family. He said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Albert Einstein once said, rejoice with your family in the beautiful land of life. The family brings us joy and happiness, it's true. Yes, there may be many problems, but like branches of a tree that grow in different directions, in the end they come from the same trunk and they are fed by the same root. Psalm 128, which is, which is our scripture for tonight, is a picture of the idyllic family home as the Lord God designed it to be. A loving father, a loving mother, and blessed children in close fellowship as a family. The psalm also teaches us what exactly it means to cultivate a happy, abundant, and fruitful family according to the grand designer's plan. It will pay to examine the psalm and on finding the keys to an idyllic family life go on to implement them in our lives, in our families. Join me now as I unpack this short psalm that is full of pointers and advice to starting and maintaining a fully functional family. The psalmist uses agricultural metaphors to convey God's blueprint for a happy family. Psalm 128 says, Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. You shall eat the labor of your hands, you shall be blessed, and it shall be well with you. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house. Your children will be like olive shoots around your table. Behold, thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. The Lord bless you from Zion. May you see the prosperity of Jerusalem all the days of your life. May you see your children's children. Peace upon Israel. The first verse says, Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord who walks in his ways. The fear of the Lord. The first condition of these blessings that we've read to you just now is the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord means not to be afraid of God. It means having a deep respect, a deep reverence and awe for God and his power and his authority. A proper fear of the Lord leads one to love him and not to fear him. We are not called to be afraid of the Lord. Oh, no. Jesus gave us a free pass into the presence of the Almighty God, the Father. God offers to us a filial relationship, a relationship of a father and his children or a parent and his children. We are called to reverence the father as we should respect our, as we respect our earthly fathers. In the same way, we reverence our father and respect our heavenly father in love and not in fear. We do not respect our earthly fathers in fear. A functional family does not. Maybe a dysfunctional family might fear the father, but a good family loves their father and respects and obeys him because they love him. What our Father in heaven wants us to be ought to be our life's ambition. What God wants you to be should be what you want to be. The second condition in this first verse says, walk in his ways. It is a daily immersion in the things that please the Lord. We are to live as God requires. We are to pursue his righteousness and his kingdom and his thoughts and his aims and his ambitions for us. God has a plan for every one of us. And we need to walk in the way of that plan. And that you can get from the word of God. Reverence brings blessings from the Father. 
Reverence brings blessing from the Father. The word bless is translated from, from the Hebrew and it means not just to be happy, but to be blessed of the Lord, to be abundant, be fruitful. It refers to blessings from God, not man. The blessings of the Lord far exceed the blessings of man. The blessings of man are temporal and they are specific. They might work in one area of your life and not in others. But the Father, our Heavenly Father's blessings are holistic. One is blessed when one is blessed in all areas of one's life. We shall uncover the familial blessings that God gives us in the psalm in the next few minutes. You shall eat the fruit of your labor. You shall eat the fruit of the labor of your hands, the psalmist writes. You shall be blessed and it shall be well with you. It is the Lord who gives us the power to work or the ability to get well. And it is he who gives us opportunity and the grace to live to enjoy it. It is a common fallacy amongst us that we plan and we achieve because of the skill that we possess. Without the blessings of the Lord, our labor is in vain. We, may, we, we find many who labor their whole life and just when they get ready to enjoy their retirement, they die. How many people you know who look forward to their retirement and within a few years from the time they stop working, they've died. And all the, the money they've earned, all the wealth they've accumulated, all the material wealth is gone. The rich fool in Luke 12 demonstrates this. He had achieved his life's objective. He had done exceedingly above and more abundantly than he could even dream of. And he was ready to take life easy. He said, I'm going to build bigger barns and store my grain because I've achieved a harvest for many years. And the Lord said to him, thou fool, tonight I require your soul. His soul was called up. And the question is, who's going to enjoy the wealth that he worked so hard to create? God promises to bless one with long life to enjoy the fruit of his labor. Those who are blessed by the Lord live longer. That is a huge blessing, one which we all long for, but are never assured of unless we walk in his ways. If you walk in his ways, God is saying, you will enjoy the labor or the fruit of your labor. God says that you'll eat the fruit of your labor. You will be blessed. Not only will you eat the fruit of your labor, you'll be blessed and you'll be blessed. And it shall be well with you. It shall be well with you. Things will go well with you. Regardless of what's happening on the outside, God will make it go well with you. Your labor does not have to be in vain. You can enjoy a blessed retirement. These extended blessings are once again dependent on the conditions of fearing or reverencing the Lord in love and walking according to the way that he set up in his word, the Bible. The Bible also, or the psalmist also, pronounces a blessing from God on the family. And we're going to talk now about the blessed family. Your wife, the Bible says, will be like a fruitful vine within your house. Your children will be like olive shoots around your table. Two types of trees are used to demonstrate the blessedness or the blessings on the family. A family is a blessing from God. If you have a wife that is good and you have a love that is pure and you have children that are blessed, that in itself, you have a family and a home, that is a blessing in itself. A family is a blessing from God. An agricultural analogy is used, the vine and the olives. The wife is a fruitful vine, the Bible says, and the children olive shoots. Let's, let's examine this picture, find out what, he, what God is talking about. Both the vine and the olive were symbols, or, or were important in Israel and were symbols of fruitfulness. One supplied wine and the other supplied fruit, the olive fruit, and oil. These are symbols of fruitfulness and blessings. The family is a blessing. The fruitful vine is the wife. Now, in those days, the vine used to be planted in such a way that it crept or it creeped right around the house. And it gave the house a certain beauty, a certain welcome uh, ambiance about it. 
And that is what God is saying your wife will be like. Your wife will fill this house, will surround this house with her love, with her handiwork, and with the love of God shown through her. The house becomes homely when a mother is in the home. Without a mother, the home doesn't seem homely. But when there's a mother, the home becomes holy, uh, homely. The fruitful vine is the wife who makes the house merry and wraps herself around her house. She entwines herself around her husband. She's a symbol of beauty and protection and fruitful motherhood. The children, the Bible says, are olive shoots, not yet fully grown, but showing great potential. The old trees are surrounded by new shoots, which will one day replace them. If you walk into a forest, you see an old tree that is starting to dry, but you look around it, or at the base of that tree will be new shoots, not yet grown, but full of potential. And one day they will replace the old tree, all of us, as we pass on from this life to the next, we allow our children, the shoots that are growing now, to replace us. And that is what God is saying. You will, he said to King David, you will never lack a man from your house to sit on the throne of Israel. Wine and oil are symbols of the Holy Spirit. The wife, like the Spirit, is a helper to the man. A help me. That's how God ordained the family unit. The children are anointed. And represent the blessed generation, an anointed generation, anointed into the future. This is a blessing for the parents who walk in the Lord's ways. The man who fears the Lord gains a productive spouse and flourishing progeny. His children are flourishing. His wife is productive. His life is blessed. The olive shoots are pictured around a table. I want you to picture a table where the husband is sitting and the wife is sitting and the children are around the table. And when you look at it, it's, it's this picture that Psalm 128 says, the olive shoots, your children are like olive shoots around about your table. This is a displaying, this is displaying a functional family unit in unity, fellowship and peace for generations to come. And then there's a blessing for the man of God. The Bible says, or the psalm says, Behold, thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. Behold, thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. And here again, the Lord is placing accountability on the male head of the house. He's placing accountability on Adam, on you, mere man. Yes, the woman has her place, the child has his place, but the accountability of the house is, is the man's. Behold, thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. The Lord bless you from Zion. May you see the prosperity of Jerusalem all the days of your life. These blessings follow the man who serves the Lord in spirit and in truth. The blessings of a happy home. A good wife and many children would bring him respect in the community in Israel. And it even does that now. When you have a happy home and a happy family, a blessed family, you are blessed. You're respected. To fear the Lord, as we said, is the beginning of wisdom. And a wise man indeed will raise his family in the fear and admonition of the Lord. What does that mean? That means, men, you are to bring your family up. You to raise your family even your wife, yes, she's your helpmate, but the Bible says she's the weaker vessel. Spiritually, you are to, to, over, to, to cover her, to hold her, to the Lord, to keep her there, to keep the children there. Bring her in the fear of the Lord. The correction of the Lord. Then God says to the man who fears him, who brings up his family according to the plan of God, he says, the, the blessings are personal firstly and secondary, secondly national. The home and the nation are blessed. How blessed a country would it be if all our families walked in accordance with the scriptures? How blessed would our family, our country be? Not which is Zion to the people 
The Lord blesses his people to the workings of the church. So that's a threefold blessing. The Jews were proud of their religious heritage and wanted to see God's blessing come to Jerusalem. They yearned for their children to bring honor to Israel. Many of the Psalms end with a prayer for the prosperity of the city of Jerusalem and for the country of Israel. True patriotism begins in the home where the love of God, family and country are inextricably bound together. We have to love God, love our family, our country and remember peace upon Israel. Generational blessings are also promised. It ends with the words, may you see your children's children. Peace be upon Israel. This verse pronounces peace on the family unit, both present and future, as well as the country. It is both a prayer and a blessing for three generations at least, if not more. A reverent man is blessed with grandchildren. Grandchildren are the crown of old men. Ask any grandpa and he will tell you he lives for his grandchildren. We, we older folk, we grandparents, we seem not only to live for our grandchildren, we seem to live again in our grandchildren. And what a joy it is, what a joy and a blessing it is to live to see our grandchildren grow up. So yes, it's a generational blessing. I experience it, you've experienced it. When you have grandchildren, you find they are the crown of old men and women. At the end of David's reign and the 40 years that his son Solomon reigned, there was peace in Jerusalem. Seeing your grandchildren implies a long and fulfilled life, as David saw a long and fulfilled life. In this psalm, we find there's three generations represented. The bride and the groom, the husband and the wife. They have children and the children have children. And we go from a single man to a family with grandchildren in six short verses of the psalm. And all of them are walking with the Lord, working for the Lord. All of them are in the path and the design of God's family. Important to note here is that you, you, the one I'm speaking to right now, you can determine the outcome of your grandchildren's lives by building a good foundation built on the solid rock Jesus, using Jesus as the cornerstone, using the foundation that was laid down by God through the apostles and the prophets. You can determine how your grandchildren will live, not just your children. Parents are called to teach the ways of the Lord. And don't leave your child to figure, out, figure it out as he grows. Many of us in this, the so-called modern independent thinkers tend to say, I won't make the decision for my children when they marry across religious divides or even if they, they, are mar they marry within a religious uh, background, they say, let the children decide on their own. That is not giving them freedom. That is abdicating your position. That is saying, I don't know how to do my job. I am not worthy to be a parent. Let the children do whatever they want. Let someone else influence them. Let me tell you, parent, you will be accountable to God one day. And God is going to ask you, I said in my word, teach the children. Bind it on the tablets of your hearts. It said, teach them when you sit down at the table, teach them the word of God. When you walk, Teach them about the word of God. This psalm in itself is a psalm of accents. It's a psalm that was sung as they walked to Jerusalem to worship the Lord. As they walked to the temple, the families used to recite the psalm to music, to the sound of stringed instruments and get it embedded in their heart that they should follow the Lord. Parents, you ought to teach the children the ways of the Lord. Don't leave them to figure it out. Because if you leave them to figure it out on their own, one day you'll be surprised or don't be surprised when they are serving some foreign God and they don't want to come back to you to serve with you. 
No one would rightly allow a child to make an uninformed decision. As a parent, you won't let your child carry a big bag. So why would you allow the child to make a big decision? Don't let them make an uninformed decision. Parents, you ought to teach your children as is commanded in Deuteronomy 11, 19. Go home and read that. Oh, well, you are home. But read it later. Deuteronomy 11, 19. The Bible says you shall teach your children. You shall teach your children. You shall drum it in the heads. The ways of the Lord. You are accountable for them. My illustration tonight is called from the mouths of babes. It's a brilliant little story that I read in a, many years ago and I found it again. So I just want to read it to you. Or tell it to you really. A couple with a young baby were seated in a restaurant. They had gone out for their evening meal. The baby was in his high chair. He had already eaten. And he was sitting in his high chair while the parents ate. Suddenly the baby gleefully said, Hi there. He pounded his little hands in the high chair tray. He was excited. His eyes were crinkled in laughter and his mouth in a toothless grin as he wriggled and giggled with merriment. He was so excited. The mother noticed this and looked around to find the source of the little boy's joy. And there it was. It was a dirty looking man in baggy pants and shoes with holes. His shirt was torn. His hair was uncombed and unwashed. His face was grimy and unshaven. The woman was sure that although he was not near her, she was so sure that he must be smelling badly. He looked so dirty. His overcoat was tattered. And he was waving. And he was saying to the child, Hi there, baby. Hi there, big boy. I see you. He was playing peekaboo with the child. The parents were embarrassed, but the baby was enjoying himself, laughing with the old man, blocking his eyes, looking at him, blowing kisses and doing everything a child does. And these two seem to be in their own world. The old geezer was creating quite a nuisance, according to the mother and father, because all eyes were on him and the baby. Everyone in the restaurant turned and looked at them as they carried on doing what Bringing, as they carried on laughing and talking to each other. The mother looked at this old man and she said, in her mind, he's obviously drunk. And she was unhappy that he was talking to her child. The couple ate in self-conscious silence as the old bum and the young child continued the happy game. The parents hurried to the meal. They just wanted to get out of there. As soon as the meal ended, the mother grabbed the little child and she tried to get out of the her husband was still pain. She wanted to get out before the old man made any more of a spectacle. As she left, she found all of a sudden, as she tried to get through the door, the old man stood between her and the door, intent on speaking to his little new friend. As she tried to ignore him and squeeze past, the child reached, with both, reached up with both arms and propelled himself the young mother was mortified. She was speechless. She was upset. She watched helplessly as the dirty stranger and a baby, her, her loving baby, expressed their love and kinship. Her baby, in an act of total love and trust and submission, laid his tiny head upon the man's ragged, dirty shoulder. He didn't seem to mind the smell of the man. He didn't seem to mind his old clothes. He just lay upon him like he knew him forever. The man's eyes closed and his tears flowed. His aged grimy hands cradled her baby so lovingly. And the baby looked so content in the arms of the dirty old man. No two human beings have ever loved so deeply for so short a time. The old man rocked and cradled the baby in his arms. And then he looked at the mother and said in a firm, commanding voice, you take care of this baby now. The mother said, I will, struggling to speak with a lump in her throat. The old man gently pried the child from his chest and handed him lo back lovingly to the mother. He said, God bless you, ma'am. You have given me my Christmas gift. 
With a baby in her arms, she ran for the car, weeping uncontrollably. My God, my God, forgive me, she cried. She had witnessed Christ's love through an innocent child who saw no sin and made no judgment. Her baby saw a soul where she saw a beggar. She was a Christian who was supposed to love her fellow human beings, but she was blind and she had a child who could see. The child could see that this was a man who needed love just like he needed. The woman heard God ask her in her mind, are you willing to share your son for a moment? I shared mine for all eternity. Are you willing to share your son with this old man for a moment? I shared mine with the world for all eternity. Children are born innocent, but they grow up to be like their parents. What they see you do, they will do. They will not listen to what you say. They will do what you do. Don't teach them your mistakes. Don't teach them your scruples. Learn from their innocence. This little child taught his mother a lesson that day. Look at people the way Jesus looks. Walk in the ways of your Lord and your children will walk with God. If you walk in the ways of the Lord, your children will walk in with God. Keep that family unit. It's a sacred unit. The family unit is ordained and ordered by the Lord. There is a specific order in a family. There is a head. There is a helpmate. And there are children. There's a father. There's a mother. Regardless of whether they both work or not, there are specific duties that a father ought to do and specific duties that a mother ought to do. And I'm not just talking physical duties, I'm talking spiritual duties as well. And God did this. He intended this. That is why he made male and female. He didn't make two males or two females. He made them male and female, not to outdo each other, to compete with each other, but to work together. One to complement the other, to be fruitful and to multiply. Multiplying is easy. Bringing up fruitful children takes time. It takes patience. And above all, it takes good examples from the parents. I'll say that again. God wanted you to be fruitful and multiply. He wants you to be fruitful and multiply. The multiplying part is easy. But bringing, bringing up fruitful children takes time. It takes patience and good parental examples. Be the example that God intended you to be. Be the person that you intend your son to be. Men, be the man that you want your son to grow up to be. Woman, be the woman that you want your daughter to grow up to be. Don't say one thing to them and do something else and then be surprised when they turn out to be exactly like you. When I look at myself sometimes, I see my father in my behavior. I see my mother in my thinking. And I understand I am a product of those two people. Treasure your family. Hold them sacred and close to your heart. God wants to bless you individually and as a family. We are made in his image, people. We are made in the image of God. God is one being in three persons, united in everything. That is God's blueprint for a blessed family. One family, many persons, united in God, love and purpose to attract and to live in the blessings of a happy home. United in God, united in love and united in purpose to attract and live in the blessings of a happy home. I trust you have enjoyed God's word and that it has been a blessing to you. If you were inspired by it, please share it with your friends and family. There's no copyright over my messages. All our messages can be found on our YouTube channel, Riverside Tabernacle. Please visit and subscribe. That's all you have to do. Visit it, listen, watch a video, like and subscribe. Remember we are live on Facebook every Wednesday at 7 p.m. and Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. 
This is Pastor Simon. And as always, it has been my pleasure. Till next time, God bless you.